Welcome to Torah Today Ministries. My name is Grant Luton. And I'm Robin. And we are here to discuss Torah portion Mishpatim, which is found in Exodus chapters 21 through 24. And there's really nothing at all going on in this Torah portion. So this Man. may be a short one, huh, Robin? I can't. Well, first of all, I can't believe it's already been a week since we sat here last time and kind of worked our way up to this point. And here we are already. And it's such a feast. It is. It's this is an amazing portion. Just an amazing portion. This is one of those portions we shouldn't read once a year. We should read it once a week. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. Hopefully, we will whet the appetite and remove some um, barriers of misunderstanding that'll yes. make people more hungry to do just that. Good. Right? Well, I'm going to let you start it off then. Well, <clears throat> let's start with what the word mishpatim actually means. Mm -hmm. um, the word mishpatim is judgments, correct? Right. And the opening phrase of this portion in chapter 21 of Exodus is, now these are the ordinances or the judgments which are to set before them. Right. Now, a little word about judgments. Judgment sounds like condemnation, so that's it not does. what this is. That's one of the first right. inconsistent and misunderstandings we have. Yes, so let's, let's talk about the Hebrew word just for a moment. I'll turn it back to you. Um, the, the root of this is the word shafat, and it means to make wise decisions in relationships, basically. In fact, the book of Judges is called Shoftim, based on this. And what did the judges of Israel do? They would hear cases and make wise decisions concerning the people well, that was, under their authority. That was the hope. That, that was the hope. They would make wise decisions that didn't <laughs> and, always happen. Right. So uh, that is what this word is mm -hmm. about. In fact, you know, Psalm 19 is that, that, that great passage. It says, the Torah of Adonai is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of Adonai is sure, making wise is simple. It goes on with the precepts, commandments, the fear of Adonai. Then it says in verse 9, the mishpatim, the judgments of Adonai are true. They are righteous mm -hmm. altogether. So don't think of judgments and condemnations, but these are how we make wise decisions in our daily walk and interactions with other people. Well, that leads to my um, mental picture when I read this opening statement in the portion because I picture Hashem setting a table for us yes. and inviting us to come and eat and not only fill up with things that are wonderful to taste, but also they will give us strength mm. to live. And beyond anything, it offers us fellowship with him as he sits at the table right. with us. Grant, I was thinking of um, Proverbs chapter 9, where wisdom, who's personified as a woman, of course, mm -hmm. in this chapter. No, why do you say of course? Well, <laughs> not because women are always wise, but because most people know when they read Proverbs that yes. that's how she's personified. That's right. And it says in that chapter how she's built her house and she has prepared her food she's mixed her wine and she has set her tables mm -hmm. and she or her table and she sends out her maidens to invite any who will come right. and that popped in my mind the minute I read this opening uh, statement in our right. portion okay well speaking of setting a table um, last week I, we ended the teaching with a question uh, because last week in portion Yitro, we see the people of Israel at the foot of Mount Sinai and God's presence is descending on top of the mountain and smoke and in fire and there's, there's, the earth is quaking and they hear his voice and the sound of the shofar. They are absolutely terrified. He speaks from the top of Mount Sinai. So here they are at the foot of the mountain but now at the end of this Torah portion in chapter 24, the elders along with Moses and, and uh, Aaron and two of his sons, they go up to the top of the mountain. And this was the question we posed at the end of our last discussion. How do we get from the bottom of the mountain to the top of the mountain? And why did they get to go? Yes, and, and, and at the foot of the mountain they're terrified, so there's mm -hmm. absolute fear of God. But now they sit up there and they have a meal. Here's what it says. It's in Exodus 24, and we'll start with verse 9. Moses, Aaron, Nadav, and Avihu, and 70 of the elders 
of Israel ascended. So there's 74 people in, uh, that go up. Uh, 74 is the numerical value of the word aid, which means witness, testimony. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, so they are going up to bear testimony. They saw the God of Israel. Hmm. They saw the God of Israel. And under his feet was the likeness of sapphire brickwork. And it was like the essence of the heaven in purity. Against the great men of the children of Israel, he did not stretch out his hand. They gazed at God, yet they ate and drank. There's a covenant meal. So the people who are terrified in chapter 20 are now sitting down to table fellowship with the God of Israel in chapter 24. How did they accomplish this? What happened in between? And the answer is Mishpatim. Mm. And so the personal application is this. Everything must begin with the fear of God. Fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And you can't really have love for God until there's a healthy fear of who this God is. Because you don't fear him, you don't know who he is, and how can you love someone you don't know? But you're not talking about fear as in, I think that this is something that will harm me and I mustn't draw close. Right, there has to be a healthy awe of God. Okay. We have to realize he is our creator, our sustainer, he is our judge, but he's like a father who is loving and kind and generous, but he's also going to discipline us and spank us when we're out of line. And uh, so we need to have this healthy respect and awe of God, because that Everything. he deserves that. Yeah. And if you don't have that attitude towards him, you really don't know him, and you're loving some kind of God that doesn't exist. Well, you know, Grant, going back to that picture of him, of, of the, the Lord setting this amazing meal and table, inviting us to come, the phrase from scriptures that says, taste and see the Lord is good, comes to my mind. Yes. But in the case of Mishpatim, so much of my life I've spent not understanding it and being a little bit nervous about it and assuming that it wasn't going uh. to be good for me. And so I didn't draw close enough yeah. to the table to taste it. This is one of those things, as the people said, we will do and we will hear. That's right. The order of those is mm -hmm. essential to understand because this is a case of you have to taste it to understand it. That's right. You have to experience it to really know it. Exactly. It's it, like with any kind of a skill we develop, you have to do it before you really begin to understand it. There's a saying by a gentleman called Mr. D.W. Mower, and he says it's easier to act yourself into a better way of thinking than to think yourself into a better way of action. Mm. And so the people are saying, I need to experience and taste, and then I will know mm -hmm. the one who That's has prepared right. this. That's right. So we can think of each of these commandments we find in Mishpatim as a rung and a ladder that will take us to the top of the mountain. Mm. But you have to climb it. You have to climb it. You have to enter it. I remember last year when I was teaching on this, uh, I came across a book by Rabbi Avigdor Miller, and he, he brings out this amazing insight. He said, you know, here are the people of Israel, God is descending on top of the mountain, he's speaking, they're terrified, it's, it's something that is so awesome and otherworldly. And so then he calls Moses up to speak to him and give him his instructions. And the people are probably thinking, oh, he's going to be do, uh, revealing these deep insights and these hidden truths and these secrets to Moses to come back and share with us. So Moses comes back and says, <laughs> they're saying, okay, what did he say? What did he say? Moses says, okay, well, you know, if you see your neighbor's donkey in the ditch, you help him get it out. And if somebody steals something and you're catching with it, he has to pay back double. And um, if you have a Hebrew servant, you, after six years, you let him go free. And they're probably thinking, what? This is the deep stuff right. God's <laughs> talking about? But the, uh, Miller says this amazing thing. He says, the preface to living a life of awareness of Adonai is the knowledge that this world is not ownerless. We have to realize that even to walk in the face of the earth, we need permission. 
And what he's saying is, is that Mishpatim, every one of these commandments reminds us that this world belongs to God and the people in it belong to God. And every step you take in this world, you're stepping on a world that does not belong to you. Mm. And so when you mistreat another person, you're mistreating something that belongs to God, someone who belongs to Him. And when you use an object, you need to realize this is something that does not belong to me. This is something God has that He's allowing me to use. The, the rabbis all teach, if you take one bite of food and you don't thank God for it, you're a thief. Wow. Because you're not recognizing this is something He has given you mm. to sustain you and to enjoy. And so Mishpatim is so invasive, it invades every area of our lives. So God's saying, I have standards for this and for that and for this other thing over here. And it boils down to love. It does. How to receive His love how to learn to love him back and love others. Yes. We went to dinner at my sister's last week and she has this great little sign on her wall near her door. It says, <laughs> love God, love others, the end. Yeah, I love that sign. And we laughed, but we said, that is it. It, it is. sums up everything. And yeah. really, that's a great description yes. of his Mishpatim, isn't it? And that is what Mishpatim is about. And, um, so if we want to climb that ladder to have intimate fellowship with God, we need to keep these commandments. No wonder the enemy hates these and commandments. And you know what he does? You know what the enemy does and it ruins everything is he causes us, if we can't ignore them, which is one of his schemes that many of us, you know, fall prey to, he'll get us to make idols of the commandments themselves because we can commit idolatry by making the commandments an idol yes. and not understanding their essence. Right. And that's what I hope we can convey in the next few minutes is how every commandment has an external and an internal right. meaning. And if you can't get to the essence right. or the internal part of each commandment, you're missing God's heart. <laughs> well, let's take an example to how we can apply this. If you look at Exodus 23, verse 5, and what we need, this is why I'm saying we need to read this portion every week. It might be something I start to actually put into practice mm -hmm. because these commandments are so very important. That's so funny, Grant. This is the one I was going to pull out exactly about the donkey. <laughs> well, there we go. <laughs> okay. See, great. We should get married. So tell me what you were going to say okay. about it, and I'll well. tell you what I was going <laughs> to say about it. <laughs> well, it says if you see the donkey of someone you hate crouching under its burden, would you refrain from helping him? You shall help repeatedly with him. Mm -hmm. So, for some person might say, well, I don't know anybody who owns donkeys. And, um, and so how can I ever keep this commandment? Well, you can keep it in a ton of different ways. Because this, what does this donkey represent? It just represents something that is, uh, uh, that belongs to a neighbor, to someone else you see, and there's suffering going on. It, it represents the ordinary, everyday life stuff. Yes. And this happens to be somebody you hate. We all have people we don't like at all. We mm -hmm. just, we emotionally just don't want to be around them. They rub us the wrong way. They hate us. But it says, you shall help repeatedly with them. Why does God tell us to do that? Because that's what God does. Mm -hmm. Do you ever wonder why people who are so uh, immoral, so wicked, so evil, they continue to get blessed because God continues to help them repeatedly. Right. Even though they hate God, He does not that let that get in the way of Him helping them, giving them another day of life, maintaining their health at least to some degree, and He's still working in their lives, but he doesn't do to them what we would do and just crush him under his heel. And so he's saying, this is a principle by which I live. I want you to live according to this principle as well. When you do, your soul aligns with mine. We begin to have intimacy. You begin to come up the mountain to sit with me and eat with me. Mm. So this is just one example. Well, I was thinking too about how this demonstrates God's compassion for the helpless, even a donkey. Mm. And he wants us to notice any creature that needs yeah. relief, even a donkey. But yeah. in doing so, we're serving our enemy. And in doing so, 
we are overcoming that animal part yes. of our own nature that needs to be rescued. And yeah, we're not living like the rest of the culture, are we? Right. We're living according to the kingdom culture. Because in order to suppress our Yetzer Hara and that ego that mm -hmm. is our enemy, or Amalek, if you please, yeah. we have to serve our enemy yes. and let it go yeah. and get over ourselves. And helping an enemy's donkey under a heavy load is certainly a picture of getting over ourselves. Absolutely. You know, I have to include here before I forget in Psalm 89, 14. Listen to what this says. We've all heard it before. It says, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Now that word for justice, guess what it is? Mishpat. Isn't that amazing? That's Mishpatim. So righteousness, we all want to be righteous. And Mishpat, these two things are the foundation of your throne. So we want to be righteous, but we may see the donkey of somebody we hate. We're thinking, well, I'm not going to help him. He needs to learn. God's punishing him. So I'm just going to ignore him. And, and God says, no, 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 no. Uh, you, you do what the Mishpatim says to do. And these two things, the foundation of his throne, this is where he rests his presence. This is where he is. This is the top of the mountain. The earth is his footstool. But his throne is something he wants us to come up to, and we do that by practicing the mishpatim. That's the ladder up. But in order to climb this mountain, we have to get past the mechanical observance of these commandments. Yeah, otherwise it's just mechanical observance. Exactly. It's just legalism. And within every commandment, Grant, is mm -hmm. love. There is. Every commandment is an opportunity to express love for God and love for our neighbor. And if we keep a commandment out of love for ourselves, everybody look at what I'm doing. I'm helping this person I hate and who hates me get his donkey out of the ditch. Everybody watch what I'm doing. We're not fulfilling the commandment. Well, can we, can we um, dig down a little bit in this? And sure. maybe unpack a few of the commandments and look at how beyond the outward um, mm -hmm. words there right. is um, something really important inside. Like one of the things I think that most of us have misunderstood for our whole life is where we're told an eye for an eye, a tooth for a oh, tooth, yes. a hand for a hand, a foot <laughs> for a foot. So I grow up, grew up thinking, well, in God's old law, he was saying, if someone hits you, hit them yeah. back. If someone put your eye out, put their eye out. Yeah. But then, you know, in the New Testament, we're told how to really love people better. Yeah. So, <laughs> I know. Yeah. You know, if, <laughs> this uh, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, where you get to take vengeance on people who, who hurt you. If we followed that, everybody would be blind and toothless, wouldn't they? Isn't that the truth? So help yeah. me understand. Okay. Well, the context of this, and this, this phrase, if I'm not mistaken, is found three times in the Torah, at least twice. But uh, it's in chapter 21, um, in verse 24. And it says, an eye for an eye. Well, actually, 23, it says, a life for life, then an eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for a bruise. And the context of this, though, is not me taking vengeance on someone who's hurt me, but me restoring damage I've caused to another person. And that changes everything. Yes. So in other words, if I accidentally knock out a tooth or put out an eye, I have to take steps to repair that. The sages all agree, without exception, this is not about vengeance at all. It's about personal responsibility and restitution of any damage we cause in the world. Remember, this world is not ownerless. It doesn't belong to us. And this is how we can help bring repair. Yes. Even if we make a big mistake. Yes. Now what's interesting is that when you read this, it just, our Yetzir Hurrah wants it to gravitate towards vengeance. Mm -hmm. They hurt me, I get to hurt them. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Yeshua even quotes it that way. He says, this is the way you've been reading this. And, uh, but he brings correction to it. He's restoring it back to its original purpose, which is, is about my responsibility to you. Do you see how misunderstanding this command oh my goodness. or judgment makes us really misunderstand God's very heart? Oh my goodness, yes. And what's interesting, and uh, if you haven't listened to it, uh, this week's 
uh, Parsha seasonings that I did where I dig down on some of the Hebrew details. That word for in Hebrew is the word tachat, tachat. Uh, it's ayin tachat ayin, eye for eye. Shin tachat shin, tooth for tooth. The word tachat is spelled tav ket tav. Tav ket tav. Tav means cross. Mm -hmm. So you've got a, a cross on the right and a cross on the left. Mm. And there's a letter in the middle, ket, which is the eighth letter, which represents life. When you look at this tachat, you're looking at a picture of Calvary. Cross on the right, cross on the left, but in the middle cross, there's life. Yeah. And so what Yeshua did when he was on the cross was fulfilling this passage. He was not taking vengeance on us, but is restoring the damage that sin has done to us. It wasn't even his responsibility to restore. But he realizes sin has blinded us, it's lamed us, it's bruised us, it's beat us. And he's saying, I'm going to take that punishment instead. I'm going to restore. So he lays down his life and he becomes a servant of all. Yeah. And he shows his love. And the very first of the judgments is dealing with if you are, if you have a slave or a mm -hmm. servant who's worked for you and wants to remain, this mm -hmm. is how the proper yes. way to treat them is. Right, exactly. So let's talk about that one sure. for a minute. That's the very first one in Mishpatim. It is. We find it in chapter 21, um, starting in verse 2, right away. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, it says, if you buy a Jewish bondservant, Evid Ivri is the Hebrew term, he shall work for six years, and the seventh he shall go free for no charge. Can I interrupt here? Absolutely. Because one of the major misunderstandings is that the Old Testament um, um, re defends and encourages, I'm sorry, I couldn't yeah, think of the word. Defends slavery. Slavery, no. the no. way we understand slavery. No, so. not at all. Um, in fact, throughout the scriptures, the tone is, is that uh, God wants freedom. For mm -hmm. freedom, he has set us free. He wants everyone to be free. But with that said, slavery was simply a reality of the ancient world has been from the beginning of time, still is well, in many parts of the world. Well, we all have bosses and workers yes. and culture and society and requires. To that. Absolutely. But slavery was just a reality. And so the wonderful thing about the Torah is that it really puts limitations on what a, an owner of a slave can do. It, it enforces respect for the servant, for the slave, and providing for that person, the very and taking opposite care of them. Of what yes. we're told. Ideally, ideally, freedom is what God wants. Ideally, God wants one man married to one woman, but he allowed multiple marriages mm -hmm. in the Torah. He just did because that was the reality of the day. But he gives provision to he, protect exactly, people. Exactly, but he gives rules. Says, but if you're gonna have more than one wife, here are some principles you've gotta follow. So, um, but there are prophetic insights into this. Uh, but I, I love this as we go on. It says, in the seventh year, he shall go free for no charge. If he shall arrive by himself, he shall leave by himself. If he is the husband of a woman, his wife shall leave with him. Now, verse four is interesting. If his master will give him a woman and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall belong to her master but he shall go out by himself. But if the bondsman shall say, I love my master, my wife and my children, I shall not go free. Then his master shall bring him to the court and shall bring him to the door or to the doorpost. And his master shall bore through his ear with an awl and he shall serve him forever. So here, we, it sounds cruel that the master would say, well, if you uh, want to leave uh, this woman I've given you for wife and the children she bore you, they stay with me. Right. But think about it for a moment. If you're a bond servant and you realize I'm going to be working for this man for six years, and let's say in the second year he says, would you like a wife? And so, yeah, I'll take one. And he <laughs> provides this wonderful woman and she lives with you and bears children to you. What kind of monster would you have to be to say at the end of your six years, okay, I'm out of here? Well, it would reveal your heart of selfishness. Exactly. 
would it be a kindness for the master to let the woman and children go with this schlub who decides, I'm just going to get out of here? So it's a test leave? that reveals his Yes. Heart. So a, a real man, mm -hmm. if he plans to go free within six years, is say, no, I'm going to be leaving when my indenturement's over. I don't want to leave a wife and children behind. But if he takes that wife and children, mm -hmm. then he's probably the kind of man who's going to stay with them. But you notice his ear is pierced on the, the mezuzah, on the doorpost. And David later refers to this and uh, says that he's going to be bondservant. It says, my ear you have pierced. In other words, David says, I want to be your bondservant forever. I want you to be my master. I want to be your servant forever. And then Hebrew quotes it and applies it to Yeshua. That this ear piercing is a picture of the crucifixion. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Because a, a bit of blood would certainly be shed there. Oh, yeah. When the bondservant remains. And yes. I, I'm going back to what we talked about a minute ago, how God wants the heart of his people to say, I'm going to do this, and then yes. I will hear you better. Yeah. And so the ear is the part that the is is to the door yeah. and he can hear right. the heart of the master. And this is a picture of the mezuzah. I know many of the people listening will have a mezuzah on their doorpost. Mm -hmm. And that mezuzah is right about the level of the ear. And inside is the Shema. Shema, hear, O Israel. And when I put a mezuzah on the doorpost, and when I'm with others and we're celebrating a new home and putting a mezuzah up, Always remind them this mezuzah should be a picture of you giving your ear to God to pierce to that doorpost. Look at this as being the hole in your ear and you saying, God, I want to hear you. I want to be your servant forever. So when people were out and about in town during those days and they saw a man who apparently was a servant yeah. and they saw that his ear is pierced, they immediately yeah. knew that he had heart subject yes. and devoted to his master. And they knew also that he had a master who would protect him and avenge him. So don't do anything to this guy. See, it was a protection as isn't well. Isn't this a wonderful example of how at a first glance, yeah. the outside of that commandment yeah. doesn't seem to make sense. Yes. But when you draw close enough and you exactly. taste it and you, and you, and you see yes. that he is good. It's like coming up to the Lord's table that he has spread and saying, uh, I wasn't raised with that kind of food. I don't think I like it. I'm not going to eat it. And you turn and you walk away and you miss, no. you miss you it. You miss it all. And you know, Paul, he, while you're talking, I'm reminded that Paul, he calls himself the bondservant mm. of Yeshua. That's a direct reference back here to Exodus 21. He's saying... I don't want to live free of him. I want to serve him with my life forever. I am his willing, voluntary bond servant. So he's inviting us to experience a life of giving, not a life of self-protection and taking, because that's where the people had sort of come to in slavery. Mm -hmm. um, just uh, an attitude and an experience in life of having to really survive yes. and self-protect and not much thought to how you live in harmony and peace and love with other mm -hmm. people because they were so busy just trying to survive. Right. And God's saying, but there's a better way to live. Absolutely. Climb the mountain, come closer to me, hear my heart. These are ways to know how much I love you. You can receive mm -hmm. what I'm giving you. And then once you receive it, you're going to have something to give Absolutely. out to those around you and love the people around you. That is the whole point. That's right. Our problem is we, we read through Mishpatim too quickly. And each one of these commandments, we need to slow down and say, Father, what does this teach me about your heart? And, we read, and how do I apply it to my we life? We read them wearing the lenses of God being a harsh taskmaster. Oh. Think about it, Grant. Yeah. And, and we're not in awe of him, and on our heart isn't trusting oh, his heart enough to draw close enough to hear what he's trying to say. I know. It, it's just ridiculous. It's a deception of the enemy to keep believers from living godly lives that, where we have intimate table fellowship with God on the mountain. Okay, so part of my role here is to ask the hard questions that some of our listeners might be thinking. Uh-oh. And that's what I'm going to do here. <laughs> so as we read through God's um, words, 
to us and we see him endorsing and encouraging taking the life of someone mm -hmm. who would take the life of another, it sounds like God is a bit bloodthirsty and wants <laughs> us to just yeah. um, think and turn toward capital punishment in many, many ways. And so that is another way yeah. that pe people who don't understand will say, oh, so you think we should go back to the law and kill people when, kill women when they step out of line and kill children yeah. when they disrespect parents? That, no. is, that is what we hear. <laughs> well, none of that is in here. Um, there, in this Torah portion, Mishpatim, there are eight capital crimes mentioned. These are the eight things, and if someone does these, they need to be put to death. But I don't have the right to do that. You don't. It's something that the courts, the judges, mm -hmm. would have to impose. And what, what is eight? Eight is the number of life. It's the number of life. And remember, this world is not ownerless. This is God's turf we're on, mm -hmm. and he makes the rules. So with that said, we, there are two extremes. Human beings always tend to go to extremes, and there's two extremes. One extreme is, let's have severe punishment for every slight infraction. And in some parts of the world, if you steal something, they cut your hand off. So that's unrestrained justice. Unrestrained, yes. Yeah. Just, uh, Craziness. It, it's a miscarriage of justice. Right, what, what people yes. try to call justice. If a child embarrasses her family, they just murder her. The mm -hmm. father takes her out and kills her, the, and the Bible forbids that. And that happens in some cultures. It happens in some cultures. So you see this, uh, this extremely severe, harsh judgment. That's one of the extremes the culture can go to. But there's another extreme that's just as dangerous, and that's where nobody pays consequences for anything. Welcome to America. Yeah. So here's this guy who's a serial killer, and we put him in prison, and well, we don't have the right to take his life, and, and that's cruel, and we don't want to be like him. And the thing is, that deteriorates culture just as much. Cultures will rot from the inside out by too much chesed, that's right. too much mercy and, and soft-heartedness are too much gavura, and that is uh, a, a hyper-justice. Right. God shows us the balance. He shows us the bullseye. And it's always beautiful. Yes. Because he's, balance is where it's at. Exactly. And he says in Mishpatim, there are these eight things. And if you allow these people to live, he's speaking to the judges and to the courts. Mm -hmm. And if you don't deal with this and cleanse my land of the stain they bring on it, it's going to spread like a cancer and is going to bring destruction to the people. And we see that historically in the scriptures when they didn't deal with things. Imagine living in a society where everything is perfectly fair and balanced. And we know that if someone does something that endangers or takes the life of another, they're going to be dealt yeah. with so that it doesn't run rampant and it's safe, yeah. it's peaceful, it's kind. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yes. I would love to live in this kind of oh, world. Oh, yeah. But we, the cruelty of living in a world that's so passive is that victims have no rights and they don't care about the victims. They're, they were, they're too soft hearted towards the criminal. Right. And, uh, and as I a result, if, we get more criminals. And I think if we're all really honest and um, <laughs> permitted to speak our mind for a moment, we all crave justice when a yes. life is taken and a father whose daughter is harmed is by his very nature yes. a good nature that god yes. gave him he wants to see justice happen and the, the life exactly. of his daughter defended and that allows healing to take place right so um, so there is a righteous yes. retribution that there god is. endorses there is and again, it's very limited, it's narrow, and it's very balanced, and it's very precise. And when it happens, it's not necessary to happen very often, is it? No, mm -mm. it doesn't need to happen very often at all. If the rules are applied correctly, you don't need to apply the rules as often when mm. it comes to this sort of thing. Well, you know what? I'm looking at our clock, and we've gone... This might be a new record for us, oh, Robin. Oh, have we I, gone over? And I feel like we've hardly gotten started. Well, gosh, Mishpatim is, let's just review, it's all about promoting peace and quality of life for, it is. for all of us. Absolutely is. So, well, hopefully, if you all have been listening to us 
you'll take our advice to read this particular Torah portion over and over and over again. Take your time with it. Mm -hmm. Take one of these uh, commandments a day and just use it as a day to meditate on that. And what does it teach you about God? What does it teach you about yourself? And what can you do about it? You know, we read in John how God so loved the world that he gave. Mm. He gave back in Exodus when he gave us these righteous judgments. Yeah. He gave thousands of years later when he gave us our Messiah to live right. out what a life like this looks like. He That's wants right. us to receive from him so that we can be given That's as exactly well. That's exactly right. And he wants intimate fellowship with us at the top of the mountain. And Mishpatim provides the ladder because as we make these changes in our own lives and as we see God more clearly through these, these commandments, uh, we draw closer to Him and our souls align with His. And that's exactly what this life here is all about. So, all right. Well, until next time, uh, we'll see you in, in Torah portion Yitro, which introduces the tabernacle. Mm, Yitro and, was last. Oh, I'm sorry, not Yitro, but Teruma. <laughs> thank you. That's okay. All right. Well, thank you, Robin. And um, uh, so we'll see you next week in Taruma, which introduces <laughs> the, the tabernacle, one of my favorite topics. So and then we wish you shalom and may God bless. Goodbye. Thank you for joining us for today's teaching. If the work of Torah Today Ministries has touched your life, please consider making a donation or sponsoring an upcoming video. As a video sponsor, you'll have an exclusive opportunity to memorialize a family member, celebrate a special event, or simply support the ongoing creation of similar content. Your tax-deductible contribution helps ensure that our teachings continue to reach all who are longing for truth. Click the link or visit our website to learn more.